Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture on glycolysis. Now I know a lot of times students are really scared of glycolysis because they picture having to draw out every single molecule in the cycle and every carbon and everything, but I'm not going to put you through that torture. Instead, I'd rather focus on the significance of the cycle and on the significance and function of each of the enzymes and steps within that cycle and the various implications in terms of your health, in terms of the medical field, and the overall metabolic regulation of this process. Now, before we get into the details of glycolysis, I just want to review some key terms that we've mentioned in other lectures so far. The first one is metabolism. And a lot of times when people think of metabolism, they just think of like when you hear that, oh, I'm getting older, my metabolism is slowing down, you know, I can't, you know, lose weight as quickly. But in fact, metabolism is not just breaking things down and losing weight. Metabolism is all of the chemical reactions in your body or in a cell, which means both building things up and breaking them down. So please make sure to remember that it is both aspects. Now that brings me to the other reminder terms, which are catabolic versus anabolic pathways. And when I've mentioned this before in previous lectures, I reminded you that for catabolic, think of ca a cat just scratching apart a sofa, tearing it down, breaking it down, breaking it apart. And that will remind you that catabolic pathways break things down, okay? Their purpose is for energy capture. So you break something down usually to try and get energy. Now, anabolic is the opposite of that, so I always tell students for that A of anabolic, think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, because anabolic pathways are building things up. So, for instance, anabolic steroids are what will build up a bodybuilder's muscles, okay? But they're bad. We go over that in other lectures about why they can cause dangerous problems with your body. Now, the last term that I have highlighted on this slide is the flux of metabolites, okay? And what that means, when you have flux, that means some sort of turnover, things going in both directions. So the flux of metabolites tells you the flux or the turnover of substrates and products, products being metabolites. So they're basically being interconverted. Okay, so the flux of metabolites shows you that you have substrates becoming products and products becoming substrates. You are building things up and you are breaking them down uh, within the same cell or body. And a lot of times that rate of turnover between substrates and products, that's ultimately determined by the enzyme activity. So for instance, enzyme levels and location and activity, and also the level of substrates. And your substrates, those reactants of these metabolic reactions, a lot of times those are going to be either obtained from your diet or from energy stores, you know, storage facilities that you have within your body and your cells. Now, when we talk about metabolism and metabolic processes, I always tease students and I tell them that you're going to have to memorize all of these metabolic maps that we have here. In actuality, I just show you these figures to kind of give you the major take-home message about metabolism when it comes to my, uh, my, any, any kind of biology class, including biochemistry. It's basically that I want you to see metabolic pathways are very connected to each other. They overlap, they are highly interdependent, and they are extremely intricately controlled. We're going to go through with each of the metabolic pathways in this course, the regulation of them, and it's very highly controlled. But the big message here 
is that you have metabolic maps, you have metabolic pathways that are very dependent on each other. They are all connected, and you're going to see that as we go through each of the metabolic pathways in this course. And a lot of them will have to do with energy conversion or um, metabolic synthesis and degradation. And we'll go over throughout this course, one by one, each of the metabolic pathways. Today, we start with glycolysis. Now, when we talk about metabolism and metabolic pathways, free energy, our old buddy free energy, that delta G that we talked about in previous lectures, comes back to bite us in the butt. Uh, delta G, as we've mentioned before, when you look at a delta G, if it is negative, that's exergonic reactions. If it's positive, those are endergonic reactions. And we've mentioned previously that when you have a reaction, you want it to be spontaneous. You want it to be favorable. In life, these are good things, right? You want a relationship or someone in your life who's spontaneous. And that's what biochemistry wants too. It's looking for exciting, spontaneous reactions, which are the exergonic ones with a delta G that is negative. And remember, we mentioned the hydrolysis of ATP is a very favorable delta G, a very favorable free energy. And that's why it guides a lot of reactions because it's around negative 30 as the um, kilojoules per mole. Now, sometimes reactions are unfavorable kind of like in life. Sometimes you meet people who are unfavorable, but you want spontaneous and good enjoyment. So what can be done? You pair the unfavorable with the favorable, meaning if a reaction has a positive delta G, it, you know, it's endergonic, you can pair it with a highly negative free energy reaction such as the ATP hydrolysis that I just mentioned. And that makes the overall reaction good to go, spontaneous, it's gonna happen. Now, what else is important? The other thing that you see highlighted on this, on this slide, when you see those brackets around the product and substrate, these bra brackets tell you concentration. So the other thing, in addition to free energy that's important for reactions and how they'll occur, is the concentration of reactants and of products, okay? If you have a change in those initial concentrations, you're going to end up having a change in the reaction and, and in the overall free energy. Now, when we talk about glycolysis, we're going to be breaking down sugar, uh, specifically glucose in this process. So I kind of want to just give you a little reminder of some of the stuff about sugar. And, you know, other than being something that I love way too much, uh, not the healthiest thing, but it is very important for the body as well. The first thing I want to remind you about sugars is we have monosaccharides and we have disaccharides and polysaccharides. Now, monosaccharides, let me just grab the laser, monosaccharides are going to be single sugar molecules that either have an aldehyde group, which you see over here, or a ketone group, which you see over here. Okay, so if it has an aldehyde group like glucose, that's an aldose sugar. This one will be a ketose sugar, okay? Ketone has the ketone group over here. Now, monosaccharides, their taste, well, like I just mentioned a minute ago, a lot of us are highly addicted to them because they taste sweet. And you find them naturally in things like fruits and vegetables, okay? And when we talk about their structure, I want you to circle star highlight the term epimers. Epimer simply means that when you have more than one of these monosaccharide stru structures that look almost the same, except they differ only by the position of a hydroxyl group 
around one of the carbons. So you notice that over here, you have the hydroxyl group on this right side. Over here, everything else is the same as glucose, except the hydroxyl group around that same carbon here has been swapped to the other side. So glucose and mannose are epimers of each other, and ribose and xylose are epimers of each other because at that single carbon spot, the hydroxyl group is on the opposite side, okay? So make sure to circle star highlight that term. Now, another term you come across when you're talking about sugar is the term reducing sugar. And in previous lectures, we did that reminder of Leo says Ger. You lose electrons, you're oxidized. If you gain electrons, you're reduced. So a reducing sugar is a sugar that's able to reduce other molecules. So if it's reducing another molecule, that other molecule is getting GERD, so it's gaining electrons, which means you as the sugar that's reducing it, you are losing electrons, okay? So if you're reducing something else, you're reducing another molecule, you yourself are getting oxidized because remember, you know, the, those have to be balanced. If something's reduced, the other thing is oxidized. So a reducing sugar will donate electrons to another molecule. The sugar is losing electrons, the other molecule is gaining electrons. A very important example of that is glucose, which is why it's so valuable in metabolic pathways and in biochemistry. Now, that brings us to a really cool term, the Mallard reaction, which has nothing to do with ducks. Uh, the Mallard reaction is if you think about, you know, someone cooking bread, baking bread or cooking a nice turkey, let's say on Thanksgiving, and you see that browning on the outside of that food that's getting cooked. You see it here in the sauteed Brussels sprouts, right? That browning, that aroma that you get, even in things like making chocolates and making um, coffee and other types of baked goods, as well as the bread that we mentioned a moment ago. That's all, that browning when you're cooking these foods and that aroma release, that's all part of the Mallard reaction, which is basically when a reducing sugar like glucose reacts with an amine, okay? It reacts with an amine group while that food is being heated you get the browning process and, and it contributes to the flavor and the aroma. And that's all the Mallard reaction, okay? So it's when a reducing sugar reacts with an amine group during heating, okay? So anytime you go into bake bakery now, for instance, and you see and you smell those fresh baked breads browned and those cookies, I want you to go in there and say, wow, what beautiful Mallard reactions you have here. Okay, so always think of that now, even when you're having your morning coffee. In addition to those monosaccharides I mentioned a moment ago, we also have disaccharides. Disaccharide is simply when you have two of the monosaccharides stuck together or linked together through an O-glycosidic bond. So this right here is that O-glycosidic bond. You see it in each of these right here. And the way that that bond is formed is through a condensation reaction, which is basically like when you hear of dehydration synthesis, when you lose a water molecule to link two things together. That's an example of a condensation reaction. So a condensation reaction is when you lose a little bit of a molecule in order to link two molecules together. And then you can also have disaccharides uh, cleaved or hydrolyzed. You see this happen in your intestinal epithelial cells, especially 
And that's how you end up getting monosaccharides like glucose, fructose, and galactose in the body. And that brings us to the big scary guy, glycolysis, that we're going to go over today. Glycolysis is basically the process of breaking down glucose, which is a six carbon sugar, into pyruvate, which is a three carbon sugar. And that's why you see that there are two pyruvate molecules produced from a single glucose. So you go from six carbon glucose to two of the three carbon pyruvate. And pyruvate is a very important molecule in biology because it's the starting molecule of a lot of other reactions, including three very important fates that I want you to circle star highlight. The first one here is pyruvate can go toward anaerobic glycolysis meaning no oxygen required. In the anaerobic glycolysis, you get lactate produced, which is lactic acid. You probably think of that when you think of working out and you hear, you know, you got to be careful of your muscles building up lactic acid. That's anaerobic glycolysis. <clears throat> the second one is aerobic oxidation. So the pyruvate can go into the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation and produce a whole bunch of ATP. So this is the root aerobic or, you know, oxygen using pathway that can produce a lot of energy for the cell. And the last fate is anaerobic alcoholic fermentation, which is always the student's favorite. That's how we make alcohol. Okay, so ethanol. Uh, and so you notice these two pathways, uh, the anaerobic ones, are not producing ATP, but they do have valuable end products that we'll go over uh, later in this lecture and in future lectures as well. Now, when we talk about glycolysis, I told you it would look very scary. There are 10 steps to glycolysis, I'm not going to make you memorize all of the structures and where, you know, carbon moves and whatnot. Instead, I want you to focus on the 10 steps. Each step's enzyme that's responsible for that step and what's actually happening, what type of reaction that step is. Now, when we talk about those 10 steps, we can split this process in half. We can think of it as the first half being the ATP investment. This first half is where you have glucose, which is six carbon, getting converted to the three carbon glyceraldehyde three phosphate which a lot of times you'll see me write or say as G3P. Now, this first half of glycolysis we call ATP investment. That's going to be important. That means you're putting ATP in, so it's using ATP. The first enzyme of glycolysis is in the meme right here, hexokinase. Circle star highlight that. I'm going to want you to know the first, middle, and end enzymes for glycolysis because those are usually in any reaction, the first enzyme, the last three enzyme, and sometimes the middle one. That's how you can really regulate a process. So hexokinase is the first enzyme of glycolysis. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then you also have the second half of our 10 steps of glycolysis, that's going to be converting that G3P to pyruvate, the ultimate molecule that we want to go toward those later reactions we mentioned, things like producing lactic acid, ethanol, or uh, oxidative phosphorylation. Now, in that second half, that's going to be ATP production. So first half is ATP investment, second half is ATP production. And the last enzyme of the process we're going to talk about again later is pyruvate kinase. OK, 
Okay, important to remember first and last, and then later on we'll talk about each of the enzymes in more detail. So starting off, we have reaction number one. This is the hexokinase step, okay, hexokinase. It's going to work via an induced fit mechanism, and it's ultimately going to be converting glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. The type of reaction that this is, notice it's a kinase, so it's a phosphorylation reaction. You see how a phosphoryl group is getting added to glucose, okay? Where is that phosphoryl group coming from? It's coming from ATP. So notice that this step is using ATP, so it's ATP hydrolysis to get us that phosphoryl group, which is why we mentioned a moment ago that the reactions in the first half are ATP investment. We have to use some ATP to eventually get some ATP. Okay, so that's important. Make sure you circle star hexokinase because that's an important enzyme. Our next enzyme is phosphoglucoisomerase. So that's reaction number two is phosphoglucoisomerase reaction. Isomerase because it is an isomerization reaction. What that means is you are converting one isomer into another. And what isomers are is if you looked at these two molecules, okay, they would have the same molecular or chemical formula, but a different arrangement of the atoms in their molecule. Okay, so you notice over here you have shifted how the molecule is arranged. So here it's six-membered ring, here it's converted to a five-membered ring, but you still have the same number of carbon, the same number of oxygens, and of hydrogens, okay? You've just rearranged the molecular structure, okay? That's important because structure defines function in biology and chemistry. So if you move the structure around, you give the molecule new functions. Then we get to step three, okay? I want you to circle star highlight phosphofructokinase 1, which is also written as PFK1. A lot of times students use this meme to help them remember the answer to some of the questions that I like to ask later in the semester or on exams. So PFK1, this is going to be our third reaction. It's a phosphorylation reaction, because notice it's a kinase, and it is adding a phosphoryl group, okay? Again, where is it getting that phosphoryl group? Just like with hexokinase, it's getting it from ATP. So again, you see ATP investment. You're using ATP to eventually later on be able to make energy, okay? But right now we need to use ATP and take some energy for this. Now, this step, I told you to circle star highlight because it is the rate limiting step of the entire glycolysis pathway. It's irreversible, so you notice the arrow is only going in one way. That'll be important in a later lecture. So it's irreversible and it is the committed step. So make sure that you remember reaction three of glycolysis is phosphofructokinase one, or you could call it PFK1. It is a phosphorylation reaction. It is the rate limiting step of the pathway. Once you get through this step, you are committed to going through glycolysis and it is irreversible, okay? So this will be an important enzyme because it's going to be one of the ones we can use to regulate glycolysis later on. Now 
we then get to reaction four. This is aldolase, okay? So aldolase, which you notice is happening if you take a look at this picture, you're going from a single molecule to chop. It's chopped in half. Now we have two separate molecules. That's because aldolase is a cleavage reaction. Yeah, you hear about cleavage a lot in biology and in biochemistry. Cleavage is a good thing here. Um, we love cleavage. And so with this cleavage reaction of aldolase, you go from having these six carbon molecule to having two separate three carbon molecules. And that's important because later on our goal is to make pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule. Now I want you to notice that because of this cleavage reaction, in the next slides, you're, you're gonna see in figures just one molecule getting converted or changed. But keep in mind that now for each step, each reaction, even if we're showing just one of the molecules in a figure, you have two molecules. So the products are going to be doubled after this point. So when we go to make ATP later on, even if a figure is only showing one molecule getting modified and one ATB being produced, each of the steps at this point, you have everything being done to these two products, these two molecules. So everything's going to be doubled later on. Now we get to reaction number five, which is the triose phosphate isomerase reaction. Now again, whenever you see isomerase, that means you are shifting around or rearranging the molecule where you still have the same number of carbons, oxygens, hydrogens, uh, and, and the phosphate group and all, but you are moving around their location. So, what you see here is during this reaction, you have basically the interconversion going back and forth with those two cleavage products that we've mentioned in the previous step. And you end up having an intermediate here as well. Now, the main significance that I want you to remember about this step within glycolysis is that we are now at the end of the ATP investment stage. And at the end of this reaction, you end up having two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And that's going to be very important because that then is used in the next steps of glycolysis. So now we move on to reaction six. And now we are heading into the ATP production stage of uh, glycolysis because we said the first half is ATP investment. Now the second half is going to be ATP production. When we talk about reaction six, first of all, the enzyme or this reaction is called glyceraldehyde 3P dehydrogenase. Okay, So that's that glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate G, uh, dehydrogenase. Sometimes you see it written as GAPDH. It's going to be a phosphoryl transfer. And this basically what you see here is now you're not getting, you know, from ATP. It's not a kinase. Instead, you have a phosphoryl group being transferred from inorganic phosphate over here. Now, what's important about this step is that it produces 1,3-biz. I like to just call it 1,3-biz. It's biz phosphoglycerate. The reason why it's important that you have now produced this 1,3-biz is because when you look at the free energy table over here, you notice that what's that delta G of 1,3-biz? Minus 49.4. Okay, I'm going to say that again, minus 49.4. If you remember earlier and in previous lectures, I pointed out that ATP hydrolysis, which is used to fuel a lot of reactions, you know, to, to couple to unfavorable reactions and make them favorable, that's minus 30.5. 
So here you see 13biz is even more exergonic, even more negative of a delta G, more spontaneous, more favorable than ATP hydrolysis. That is valuable because that will then be able to couple with reaction seven and help drive the next steps of glycolysis and ultimately lead us toward getting our energy out of this. The other thing I want to point out in reaction six is notice that we are producing NADH. And like I said earlier, even though the figures right now only show one molecule of G3P, one molecule of NADH produced, we actually have two because of the cleavage reaction earlier. So at the end of reaction six, we're getting two NADH, which is valuable because I always tell you guys, NADH is like money in the bank, okay? That's useful later on for making energy. So now we get to reaction seven. And in reaction seven, you notice that we have over here, it's reversible, so you'll see the arrow in both ways. You have phosphoglycerate kinase, okay? Phosphoglycerate kinase, what is happening here is substrate level phosphorylation, okay? And you notice what substrate level phosphorylation does is it produces ATP. You have the phosphoryl group of 1,3-bis phosphoglycerate getting transferred to ADP to make ATP. And again, even though this figure is showing one molecule of 1,3-bis and one molecule of ATP, we are actually getting two ATP out of this because remember, at this point, we're dealing with two molecules of everything. Okay, so this is an important step because we are now producing to ATP, we are in the ATP production half of glycolysis, okay? So important to make note of that. Now we get to reaction eight and we are getting so close to the end. I know this is killing you. Not the most exciting of lectures, but that's okay. Uh, when we look at reaction eight, we are calling it phosphoglycerate mutase. Okay, so phosphoglycerate mutase. This is a phosphoryl shift, okay? It's kind of like when we talked about the isomerization reactions earlier where you're shifting around parts of the molecule. Here, the part of the molecule that you are shifting to another side is the phosphoryl group, okay? Now, I know when you look at that, you're like, well, we're not making ATP, we're not making NADH, why do we want to do that? Well, when you move the arrangement of the atoms within a molecule, it then gives it new functions, new abilities, and new ways to interact so that it can then head into the next reaction and do what it's got to do. That next reaction is enolase. Okay, and I use this little meme here to help you remember what type of reaction this is. You notice that you have water getting lost here. You're pulling water out. That makes it a dehydration reaction. And so now we end up with phosphoenol pyruvate. Look at that. We have pyruvate in the word, which means that we are getting very close to our final product, which we're going to see in reaction 10. And that brings us to the end of the steps of glycolysis. We are at reaction 10, which means that we are making a couple of things that we have wanted all along. First up over here, you see that we are making pyruvate now. We do that by pyruvate kinase. Again, circle star highlight that the last enzyme in glycolysis is pyruvate kinase. That will be important in terms of regulation. Now, because we are looking at this final step in glycolysis, you notice what else is happening. 
ATP production. Okay, so this is yet again substrate level phosphorylation. You have the phosphoryl group getting transferred from phosphoenol pyruvate to ADP in order to produce ATP. So like we said, the second half of glycolysis is ATP production. Now again, I know I sound like a broken record, but even though you are seeing one molecule here, one molecule of ATP, you are actually producing two ATP in this step of glycolysis. Now, this is very significant step because not only are we producing ATP, but we are producing pyruvate, which we mentioned earlier has three very valuable and important metabolic fates. That pyruvate can either go toward aerobic ATP production, meaning go into the citrate cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, and produce a whole lot of ATP for us. Or if there's no oxygen around, it can go into either the anaerobic lactate production, lactic acid, or the anaerobic ethanol production, making some of that alcohol for us. Okay, so this is a very valuable step. Circle star highlight this slide and make sure you are very comfortable with the significance of this final step. Okay, I know you are exhausted with the sound of my voice and you are so tired of glycolysis already, but we are almost done with this lecture. Here we recap what we just went through, which were those 10 steps of hell. Um, sorry, which were those 10 very valuable biochemistry steps. What I want to point out in this slide in terms of summary, again, you notice the first half of glycolysis is ATP investment, so you are putting in ATP. Again, you also notice that in these first steps, you only see one, one glucose molecule, one ATP getting put in. Until you get to the cleavage step, now you have two separate molecules going into the next stages of the process, and now you see everything is doubled. I want to make note for you that in the beginning, in the investment stages, you put in one plus one, you put in two ATP total. And in the ATP production stages, you got two plus two. So you got four after putting in two. Your yield in glycolysis is two ATP. Now, you will notice whenever we talk about things like respiration, cellular respiration, with glycolysis, we did not need oxygen at any point in this process. So this was an anaerobic process that gave us two ATP, okay? And this occurs out in the cytosol or the cytoplasm rather than being in the mitochondria. So you will see this distinguished from the other stages of cellular respiration whenever you talk about that whole process. Okay, so whether oxygen is present or not, when you are breaking down glucose, you will get at least two ATP because of the glycolysis process. Now, once we have finished glycolysis, you have pyruvate, which we said is a very valuable molecule. It's a starting molecule for many other reactions. One of the types of fates that I want to mention is that anaerobic metabolism that we mentioned in the beginning that produces lactate or lactic acid. Okay, so when I say what is produced, lactic acid or lactate is produced by the anaerobic glycolysis reduction of pyruvate, and it is an exergonic reaction by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. And with this exergonic process, you know, it's favorable, spontaneous, can, can happen. There are two connections to the medical field that I really want you to pay attention to. Uh, the first one is dentistry. What's interesting here is if you picture your teeth, I know that's not something you really want to picture a lot, but if you picture your teeth and you know they have plaque on them, 
plaque is actually a biofilm, meaning it is a huge aggregation of different species of microbes. So all different bacteria clumped up together on top of each other. I know I'm totally grossing you out right now, but think of that when you kiss anyone. You're welcome. Um, but yeah, so those clumps of bacteria, all different species, very difficult to, to get rid of. When you picture them, if you have this big clump of bacteria, the bacteria that's growing underneath the outer surface of that plaque, they're not going to have exposure to oxygen. So they will be using anaerobic glycolysis, anaerobic metabolism, right? So if they're doing that, then when they break down the sugars that are in your diet, they are going to be producing lactate and pyruvate. And if you think about it, lactic acid and pyruvate, these are strong organic acids. So what are they going to do to the enamel of your teeth? They are going to gradually destroy the enamel surface. The more sugar you eat, the more anaerobic glycolysis occurs, the more lactic acid and pyruvate produced by the plaque. Okay, that's why you end up with dental caries. And dental caries is the fancy scientific way of saying cavities. Be very careful of this because nowadays they have linked dental cavities as well as dental procedures, so surgical pr procedures on your gums and on your teeth to the fact that some of those plaque bacteria like strep mutans can then enter the bloodstream, then can go to places like your brain and your heart, and they are heavily linked to people having Alzheimer's or dementia if they make it to your brain, but also myocarditis. And one of my amazing all-star students almost died from myocarditis due to dental issues, okay? And, and being like me, you know, part hummingbird, tons of sugar. So be very, very careful about your dental health because it is related to your other body health issues. The other connection that I want to mention is cancer. Now, cancer cells are cells that have a lot of energy. They're constantly replicating, breaking things down, growing, you know, re reproducing their cells. So when you think about cancer cells, there's a term I want you to know, which is the Warburg effect. Circle star highlight that in the next slide when I put the chalkboard notes slide up for this topic. Warburg effect, what that means is cancer's molecular sweet tooth. Cancer cells a lot of times, even if oxygen is highly present, instead of going the aerobic metabolism route, a lot of times cancer cells instead will undergo anaerobic glycolysis, okay? And so they will basically um, have high rates of glycolysis and produce a lot of lactic acid fermentation. So you'll see a lot of lactate buildup when you see cancer cells, okay? Rather than them oxidizing the pyruvate and going into oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so Warburg effect is basically the preferential production of lactate even when there's plenty of oxygen present and those cells could have used oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so now here I ask a very important question, which is, is glycolysis endergonic or exergonic? So again, keep in mind when you see a negative delta G, that would be exergonic. When you see a positive delta G, that would be endergonic. Now, just as a reminder, again, exergonic are the spontaneous favorable reactions. Endergonic are not. Now, when we look at glycolysis as a whole process, you notice you see delta G, some are negative, some are positive. There's a mixture of both. But overall, the process is going to be exergonic, okay? So there'll be a large decrease in the, um, the, the free energy 
and you can see that summarized down here when you look at the negative delta G representations. Now, when you look at any reaction or pathway, again, you want the overall free energy to be negative. You want the overall process to be exergonic, but you can have some endergonic positive free energy processes throughout. You notice over here, it points out that when it comes to glycolysis, the first half where we say that you have energy investment or ATP investment, that will tend to have the endergonic reactions, whereas later on the big payoff is exergonic. And like I mentioned earlier, whenever you see NADH, in addition to ATP, that will be money in the bank. And that is a va very valuable molecule. Now, the last thing I want to mention is the control of glycolysis. Like I constantly say in biochemistry or any biology class, really, in life, you need balance. You cannot constantly have something being turned on, even though in life we tend to want to, to, to get things turned on, and that's usually looked at as a positive thing. Um, <laughs> when you think of it in total, you need balance. You you. You know, I know I say it in a dramatic way that you don't want a process, you know, just being on and active forever. You would get too much product, too much protein, uh, for instance, and you would just have a cell explode. Okay, picture it in the dramatic way to help you think of why regulation is so important. And when it comes to any process, like I mentioned earlier, the best way to control or regulate a process is to control the first step, the last step, or one of the middle steps. So in the case of glycolysis, I want you to circle star highlight that the three steps or enzymes that are most important to the control of glycolysis will be hexokinase, which is the enzyme for the first step. We have PFK1, which is phosphofructokinase, which was that rate limiting committed step we mentioned. And then we have pyruvate kinase, which is the last of the enzymes. And the reason why I keep telling you to circle star highlight these three enzymes is when we talk about other processes such as gluconeogenesis, the concept of these three being critical to glycolysis and being uh, a lot of times irreversible steps, that will come back later on. Okay, so again, hexokinase, phospho, phospho, sorry, I mess it up every time, phosphofructokinase, which you could just think of as PFK1, and the pyruvate kinase. Those are the three to remember. And that is it for today. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me in the Remind app or through email. Thank you and have a great day.